for almost all of those systems, uh, the individual is automatically opted in without given, being given the choice as to whether or not to engage with those systems. Um, like for emails, you'll get them sent out automatically and down at the bottom you get a little unsubscribe button. With most of these facial, rec facial recognition technologies, there is no unsubscribe form. first uh, speaker series of the year and of the decade. <laughs> Very cool. Um, we have Mac Pierce here tonight, um, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, my name is Mac Pierce, mm -hmm. up there, spelled, um, and uh, I'm a member here at the Asylum. I make a lot of art and technology sorts of things, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks to the Asylum for hosting and putting on this wonderful series, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, the FQ and what that is and uh, how I'm trying to address it a little bit. So let's see here. Um, I went to school at U of I for sculpture, learned about art over there, uh, moved to Boston in 2015, joined the asylum in 2017. Since then I've been working on a variety of different projects involving a lot of electronics and um, working professionally on large-scale AV projects, um, including from, uh, including uh, a large guitar-shaped hotel, um, some big faces, and that stuff. Yada yada yada. It's um, interesting, to say the least. But here, I get to make uh, a little bit more interesting stuff. So, I, uh, I've been working quite a bit on how to use machines and um, other sort of electronics as tools for expressing art um, and how to make those sort of meaningful experiences uh, like this little house window piece here that um, took a data set source from Boston PD about all of their activity and uh, visualized it as um, police lights going across a window um, sort of a look at how I could interact with those experiences as a casual observer versus someone that might see them as a potential source of violence. Um, I've also worked on a few other group projects here at the Asylum. Uh, the Back to the Drawing Board piece was shown at Illuminus and made with two other people. Uh, one Asylum member, Phil Canodal. It was sort of a analog interpretation of a video projector where people could come up and draw on transparency that would then roll through a, uh, a projector. And then a uh, fun little piece that I did, um, which was a kitchen sink on wheels that would show a binary sequence on a copper tea kettle on the counter. Um, so as you push it along, it would swing left or right and left, uh, with those being corresponding to a one or a zero. You strung it together, those ones and zeros, it would say hello world over the course of three quarters of a mile. So analog message, or digital message over copper in a very lossy format. <laughs> Thinking a little bit about how I got to this thing you see on the wall over here, this sort of project, um, I got to talk a little bit about uh, my creative process, how I come up with the sort of ideas that I put together. And a lot of the times it's looking at a, a nascent sort of process or uh, technique that I get interested in, get really excited about learning more about, and just kind of keep it off to the side until I can actually utilize it in a project that makes sense. So combining two disparate ideas into something new and uh, building it together. Um, a lot of times it turns out pretty silly, and sometimes not quite as much. So, as of recently, I've been thinking about a few things um, that are uh, just sort of floating around. Social media, Hong Kong, and facial tracking all coming up fairly recently. And then uh, some of the literature I've been um, reading a lot by this guy, uh, William Gibson. He is a sci-fi writer, started writing in the 60s, 80s, that's the one. Um, 
a lot of dystopian sort of sci-fi. He recently gave an interview um, to the New Yorker about how he came up with his settings. And uh, he tends to look at reality, see what's going sort of wonky with it, and just ratchet up. Um, a term highlighted in yellow there that I've shortened to FQ. Yeah. So, I've been thinking a lot about today's FQ. And using that same sort of technique, how can we look at what's going on here today? Um, is it applicable? I think it is. Here's the FQ meter. I'll be using it to look at a few other things. All right. So, facial recognition technologies, something I've been thinking a lot about. A lot of various stories about it coming out recently. Um, France and the UK implementing facial recognition. Israel installing uh, facial recognition cameras to look at uh, residents of the West Bank to track them continuously. Um, the FBI tapping into DMV uh, photos and uh, mug shots to compile their own database. It's, it's pretty incredible just how quickly all of this technology is spread without like much oversight whatsoever. Um, and that's even within the Western world. Uh, one particular example, uh, China has adopted this technology wholesale to quite an effect. Um, for instance, in Hong Kong, uh, during the protests, masks were banned, um, largely because facial recognition was in use there to identify protesters who were all protesting illegally, even though it was peaceful for quite a bit of the time. Um, the minority population of the Uyghurs um, has also faced systematic repression, uh, enabled partially by facial recognition technologies um, used to identify them, first off, through racial uh, profiling, as well as tracking them um, when they are within sort of the cordoned off area that they've been contained to. So, constant surveillance and um, no oversight on it. And uh, that's all uh, a little, little hairy in my book. I don't like that. So, what can we do? In thinking about all those pieces, I wanted to come up with something that would sort of fight that, that system that's been evolving, those facial recognition technologies that have coalesced in such a, such a way and become so prevalent. A lot of those times, um, well, for almost all of those systems, uh, the individual is automatically opted in without given, being given the choice as to whether or not to engage with those systems. Um, like for emails, you'll get them sent out automatically and down at the bottom you get a little unsubscribe button. With most of these facial, rec facial recognition technologies, there is no unsubscribe form. So. I started coming up with different sketches and different things to put together to make it work. Um, a veal, a veil, like a wedding veil. Like, what, what does that look like? Um, <laughs> trying to come up with like sort of funny solutions, putting like a spring-loaded curtain in front of your face that you could then like pop up and there you go. Um, also, thinking more about sci-fi, uh, William Gibson's third book in his Blue Ant series, uh, Zero History, there's a scene where 
um, these people have to make it out of London without being seen, and so they put on what's called the ugliest t-shirt known to man, which has a giant face on the front, and the cameras see the face instead of the, uh, the people that are wearing its face. So, combining those three, there we go, the animation everyone got to see. Um, pulling back the curtain on it, I came up with this sort of solution. Having the flaps inside of a hat and having them digitally printed to show a alternate face as opposed to the person wearing it. Um, it's a little tricky to make something like this work because there are a lot of high-tech solutions um, that uh, may break under imperfect situations. Um, I didn't want to make anything that had a battery or that um, required an on switch and something that could be made at home relatively inexpensively. So if anyone wanted to pick up the plans and make it themselves, they could do so. So I started assembling materials to make this thing and testing them. Um, went through a whole bunch of different fabrics and uh, printing methods to apply graphics to the flaps on the cap and uh, eventually settled on a few pieces that worked pretty well. Um, a athletic mesh usually used for pockets in like uh, jogging pants and a transfer, um, heat transfers usually used for t-shirts that are printable at home on a inkjet printer. Usually you just load them in, iron them onto a t-shirt and then you're good to go. But as it happens they work pretty well on mesh as well for full color graphics. And uh, yeah, after that it was just figuring out a way to build out those templates um, so that way they could be easily printed onto those transfer papers and putting together something that uh, that would work for it. And uh, from there, putting it together. Overall, it's about $20 in materials. Um, takes about an hour grand total. Only uses tools that you can find at home. I think the most specialized piece of it is an inkjet printer. And even then, if you really want to, you can use like a laser one or go to Kinko's. Goes rather pretty easily. And even the sewing isn't ne really necessary. If you really want to, you can just staple the flaps on and it works just fine most of the time. All right, and uh, it goes on and comes off pretty easily. The flaps stay inside the hat. All you do is take it off, tip your hat, flaps fall out, put it back on, you're good to go. Your face is then obfuscated. You can. The mesh itself is, uh, I think it's about 50% transparency. So it's like looking through a couple layers of screen door. The one thing that it's not great at is peripherals, but you know, that's a V2. And uh, after that, put together full assembly instructions and published them um, and put them up online. Uh, I posted it to Reddit and it was, I think over 100,000 people went and saw it. Um, I registered over, I think it was 12,000 visits to the assembly page. so. It's kind of gotten out there, and people are looking at it. I'm not sure if they're using it, but that's just as well. They're not being recorded doing it. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I've helped decrease the, uh, the overall world FQ just a little bit. We'll see.
Thanks. Can you talk a little bit more why it's important to have an alternative identity? Why not just have a blank sheet or QR code or something? Yeah, so the question was why it's important to have a, another face printed on the piece as opposed to like having a, a baklava where it completely conceals the face underneath and is, has nothing on it. Um, a lot of these systems are designed, a lot of the facial recognition systems are designed to register when a face is obscured or if a face um, is concealed in some other way. And so it will flag that individual for further review. Um, and it can go on to secondary systems like, I'm not sure if this is implemented, but it's been suggested that gait tracking, like tracking how a person moves and how they actually walk, could be implemented for tracking or looking at other indicators like following uh, them in a sequence of video um, by tracking what they're wearing. Um, to a point as to where they're not actually covering their face. So, the question is if I can put it on, and yes, if I can. Shown his identity. <laughs> I notice you're wearing glasses. Let's we'll see how this is going to go. Yeah, it's a little tricky with glasses, so I'm going to take them off. <laughs> <laughs> can you see me now? Yeah, yeah, a couple systems. I set up a, uh, a Pi with TensorFlow um, and set it to look at faces. Um, I also tested a few um, social apps and did never recognize me, so. I feel like there has to be some sort of conscious choice involved in whose face is on. And I don't know, how do you think? Like, I imagine, imagine it's easy to just yeah, well, I mean, that's another part of putting your face up online, is that people can like, take photos of it. Um, the question itself was uh, if there's been consideration as to using the, the, the alternate face, um, uh, using someone else's face that maybe hasn't consented to it. Um, and that is, that is a possibility with these pieces. It's a little tricky to build the templating correctly and set it all up, but if someone knows their way around a image processing software, they could do it um, relatively easily. However, if someone wants to conceal their face, there's a lot easier ways to do it. Um, in, in the instance of the, the pre-made versions, uh, this is um, Premier Xi Jinping of China. So um, he's in a position of power and he's not going to be out in any of the protests in Hong Kong. So if he's ID'd there, <laughs> I can imagine it'd be a little interesting conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the comment was whether or not I'd considered uh, using neural nets to generate faces as opposed to using um, existing people's portraits. And yes, I had thought of that. Um, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, if anyone out here uh, would be interested in um, helping me with that, I'd be very uh, interested in talking. Um, I think that's V2, um, which will also include some different patterning um, on how the flaps are made, so that way when they're down, they won't want to move around in the wind quite as much. And also concealing the ears, which apparently is another great way to identify people, especially if they've got uh, shiny stuff in them. Something that just occurred to me is tattoos. Tattoos are kind of fiducials. So I'm wondering what kind of systems are out there that are tracking tattoos. Sure, um, tattoo tracking systems. Um, you know, 
I'm not sure that I know of any. Um, the the trope for spy movies is you know you gotta go in like fresh as a babe, nothing on you, like even prominent scars. Um, I am wearing my sleeves rolled up right now. Yep. Could roll them down. Yep. Does the software recognize the face that's printed on the on the hat? Uh, the question is is f the software recognizes faces printed on the hat, and the answer is yes. Yeah, I've been able to get um, uh, Instagram filters to show up on this face a couple of times. It's funny, I get to like record myself with the dog Instagram thing with the tongue out. I'm walking around as Xi Jinping, which is but fun. will it say whose face it is? Does it, would it recognize it as being uh, this person's face, this particular uh, Chinese authority? Um, the question is whether or not it recognizes who exactly it is, and uh, I have not gotten that to work. It just confuses it? It sees a face there. But it doesn't know which face it is. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of creating a profile, um, do you have custom software that you're using, or are you just flat main through Photoshop, or what's your process there? Yeah, so the question is how I create the templates. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, to make the templates that I'd used uh, for this piece, um, I was able to find a straight on photo and two three quarters photos um, in portrait of the individual's face. And it's just a matter of aligning them on a template um, and if the colors don't match, doing a little bit of color correction so that the f two disparate photos match. But in the case of public figures, there are a lot of photos of people like that. So, you know. Um, here's a piece. Uh, if you're putting a photo of yourself online, um, you might want to consider it doing fully in profile. The, the landmarks used to actually facially um, use facial recognition on people are usually from the front on, and those landmarks don't translate very well when viewed in profile. So if you do want to put a picture of your uh, face online, take it in full profile. So uh, the question was whether or not if a whole bunch of people stood in front of a camera with a high frequency projection of faces, whether or not you could crash the underlying recognition system. It's possible, yeah. Um, these are large systems, though, and not all of the processing happens in real time. A lot of it's recorded and then processed later. So even if it does attack the system, it might, well, it'll probably do nothing to the recording system. And then if you've got a piece of problem recording that crashes the recognition system, then you look at that and say, oh, wow, what's going on here? And that's manual review, which is no good. So we've talked a lot about uh, the dystopian nature of computer vision in the world. Can we maybe talk about some of the positives that are <laughs> part of that? Sure, yeah. Um, the question was some of the positives of facial recognition technology. Um, yeah. I have pointed out quite a few of the negatives. And uh, yeah, so... Being able to unlock your phone really quickly. That's, that's um, convenience. That's excellent. Um, some of the other pieces, uh, like? Like a lost relative. Somebody, get, somebody has a disease and they get lost. <clears throat> Can't find their way home. Mm. We can use the system to figure out what happened. Like gotcha. So identifying maybe people that uh, are having are confused or aren't able to be found out in the, the wild otherwise to identify them and bring them back into safety. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think that the, the positives with facial recognition are, are being explored many times over right now. Um, and that there are a lot of great companies that are working with those technologies and building out systems that are ultimately beneficial. It's the systems 
that aren't and being able to choose whether or not to interact with those that I'm concerned about quite a bit. Beginning of your presentation, you were talking about the sources for these databases, like the mugshot or the PMB in the US. Do you know of any systems that use uh, online sources to get their credibility? Uh, like Facebook, I guess. It's like, yes, we confirm this person is Mac because it's Facebook. So there are the systems? Yes. Uh, the, the question was whether or not there are um, databases that use photos from online to compile recognition data. Um, and yes, those absolutely exist. Uh, one that was recently in the news uh, goes by the name of Clearview AI. Um, they were selling the use of their database to police departments um, across the United States. And they acquired all of their photos by scraping um, social media accounts, uh, LinkedIn. They even scraped Venmo for photos of people. And they coalesced them together to form this enormous database um, that I think their marketing material said that they, they had 50 million people in. So. A follow up to that is are there any programs or initiatives to scramble your online identity by you willingly putting up a picture of this program and then it creates many fake accounts saying, yes, this person is Alex, yes, this person is <laughs> Jimmy, yes, and then there's really no way to know. Right. Um, so obfuscation. Obfuscation? Um, that's the overall term for that sort of technique. That, what you're describing, um, the sort of creating fake accounts and plastering the internet with them probably exists in a GitHub somewhere. I'm not aware of it. Though. So I can see this also being considered a mask sometimes. You know, so if you have a, a gathering where there's a law against masks, Right. So, uh, using systems other than masks. Um, yes, those absolutely exist. Um, Adam Harvey is one artist that's been doing some pretty incredible work in that area. He created a, um, a sort of makeup schema that was all about um, blocking some of the landmarks on your face to make it so that facial recognition technologies could not uh, pick up and register the face. Um, because there are a lot of places that explicitly ban any covering that conceals identity, so masks. Um, for instance, the entire state of Virginia. Um, it's a felony offense to wear a mask in Virginia with the intent of covering up your identity with the clauses of uh, Halloween and masquerade balls. I have no idea. This is just speculation. Could someone think, uh, you know, if you're going to have a mask, you should focus our efforts on um, uh, regulations and transparency. Attempts to individually have disrupted. Uh, it's an arms race you can't win because, I mean, those in power with the technology money are going to work out ways of doing what they want to do. Um, and so, in fact, you'll lull people into this false sense of security. I can evade these. <laughs> it's not actually going to work in the end because they'll, the advances of technology will get away. Is there any truth to that? As far as um, trying to beat the man um, by working on individual evasion as opposed to larger systematic changes to the culture of it. Uh, ultimately, any 
government or corporation, um, business entity that has the resources to put together a large facial recognition system will likely be able to track you through other means beyond just facial recognition. I think one of the interesting things though is that once people see this and are interested in it, then they start thinking about the whole scheme a lot more. So even if this isn't a magic bullet to protect you in like a facial recognition dystopia scenario, it gets you thinking about it overall. This is a city of Cambridge has banned facial recognition. I think the same thing has been true in Brooklyn. Somerville has too. And Somerville has too. So it's about awareness and about making laws to enforce it. And I mean, at one point there was a uh, right to privacy um, amendment that was uh, proposed that got smacked down very quickly by big business. But it's a way to protect you know, the public from, from this kind of intrusion. Who owns your data? You know, big question. And I think that, again, it's a political thing. You know, all politics is local. You gotta start here. Yeah, Michael brings a, a great point here that it's a political question um, as much as anything, like those larger systematic changes. Um, yes, absolutely, they are. Um, Somerville is one of the outliers it uh, has banned the governmental use of facial recognition, facial recognition technologies. Um, commercial use, free game. Um, we also are very fortunate in that we have a privacy policy for all of our in-use city um, security cameras. And they're all registered and mapped on the city of Somerville's website. You can go and know where every single one of the cameras that the city of Somerville uses is. Um, but that is absolutely an outlier. I liked um, the numbers you said that, that you got on it when you put it on Reddit. Uh, so that's a great example of how you did something lots of people thought was awesome and cool and it inspired them and thousands of people then were kind of connected to this idea that maybe they hadn't thought of before. And uh, um, uh, maybe then um, my own thought would be, uh, uh, like, if uh, uh, people could be um, more, uh, when they do stuff that's as cool as that, um, connecting that cool act um, and, and act, uh, stuff like that um, with um, arrows to different organizations that if you love doing boring um, stuff that can really help um, uh, dig out this problem um, uh, in, uh, um, in, a, in a way that um, like you can, uh, a lot of people can do. Mm -hmm. People like you who are really inspirational um, and have the power to draw in people who can then um, uh, like, um, assemble um, into organizations. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Trey. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so. As much as anything, this project was about raising awareness. Like, I, I had a couple of uh, clothing companies approach me and say, like, we want to make this. And I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And they're like, uh, what? And I said, yeah, plans are on my website, go on ahead. It's, um, yeah, it's something that I saw that I wasn't, I didn't like, and I put together a project and put together something in the way that I knew how to try and address it. And it came out kind of cool. Um, have you seen it pop up over 
overseas in these sorts of situations like that? Question as to whether or not I've seen it in the wild, and the answer is no. And um, on one hand, I'm okay with that. Those people aren't being recorded. <laughs> or maybe they just don't exist. I'm not sure. But either way, it's out there. So you've been thinking about this quite a bit. What do you see in the next 10 years of this identity tracking software? How is it going to develop? So uh, how it develops, how facial recognition develops in the future. Um, Hopefully, it's through ethical systems that are developed for the public good and that people can utilize them as services and opt in and have them be distributed uh, in such a way where you get like a, like a login that you can choose to use through your face. Um, I don't think that that is realistic, though. What's likely going to happen is that a lot of these systems are going to be developed by companies trying to put together products and market them for just about every use under the sun. And there's going to be a reactionary um, uh, reaction that causes legislation to be passed, um, either severely limiting it or codifying it as all in the clear. I think we're, we're headed pretty quickly towards one of those extremes and not sort of a middle ground. Have you heard about the Ring doorbell camera? Um, I guess it's like an Amazon product or something. There was a, this kind of like a private company doing stuff that you can't really like opt out of. They said one of their engineers was wrote like an op-ed saying like this product should be like killed because it's like just you know, a can of worms. But I guess that camera, the, like law enforcement has like a back door into it. And you know, if your neighbor has one, you kind of have one. And it's part of Amazon. Yeah. Right. So like kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really yeah. So Ring is interesting in that they got all of us to put cameras on or a lot of people to put cameras on the front of their house which then look at their neighbors and uh, <laughs> Amazon the company that owns Ring um, markets it and saying like it'll keep porch pirates off of uh, from stealing your packages which benefits them and it also means that they have an enormous repository of video um, that can then be um, marketed as a uh, data set unto itself. Now, whether or not the actual video is sold directly, um, I don't think that is. However, there is um, in use now a heat map that is used by Amazon and reported to local police departments saying where these cameras are, so that way local police departments can go to a homeowner that has a ring camera installed and said, hey, we want that video, give it to us. Um, we think something might have happened on your street or across the street. Uh, ring has also uh, had some pretty poor security practices and just recently there was a very large hack where um, people's uh, passwords were um, leaked online and a lot of cameras viewed remotely by people other than their owners. On top of that, uh, it's also a system administrated by people and any system that has a lot of people that work on it um, will have bad actors within that system. So there have been reports of um, Ring employees accessing the feeds of people's cameras to use them improperly. Uh, so with those specific instances, I don't know the details of, but you can imagine that if someone has a view into your home that you aren't allowing. It can be used for nefarious purposes. Again, this is a political issue. You have to have laws that are stern, coming down hard on people that abuse your data. And again, who owns your data? If it's a camera in your house and it's on the, in the cloud, you know, you're screwed. So there has to be laws to protect you. And again, you know, 
Somerville, Cambridge, you know, this little enclave of Massachusetts is pretty enlightened in that regard, and it has to spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the thing about owning your data, uh, absolutely. The moment that you bring in a cloud service um, to administrate the cameras that you put up, so Ring, Wise, um, I think Google HomeKit is one of the other major ones, um, they have privacy policies that we don't read that say that they can access a lot of that data, especially if law enforcement requests it. Um, and we, a lot of times, don't have ways to delete that. Um, let's see, uh, GDPR in Europe um, was passed that allows you a, basically, data bill of rights. Allows you to request deletion from services, um, see what information various services have on you, a whole gamut of things. Um, California recently passed a similar measure, um, the California Consumer Protection Act. Uh, I might be getting that acronym or name wrong, but all the same. Um, that has similar protections, but it has been challenged and widespread adoption of it is not out there yet. This topic came up once about five years ago, and I had a friend who was a, a sociology major, and he had this really weird take on it. I just thought I would throw it out into the world, which is that basically for most of the existence of humanity, the chance that you would be a, in a place where you were not recognized was very close to zero. You never left your village. Everyone in your village knew who you were. Everyone in the next village over knew who you were. So in a certain sense, this is not like we're moving into something that has never ever happened before. We're just sort of like walking backwards into some, you know, realm that, that you know, existed in mystical times or something. And I just thought that was a very interesting. Well, incidentally, you should tell everybody who's using your system, of course, not to walk around with your cell phone if they don't want people to know who they are and where they are. That's that's an interesting take that um, that with the population size like being so small in hunter gatherer societies that it would have been, you knew everyone around you. I think that's an interesting comparison, um, but there are so many people now and so many different rhetorics and so many different ways to other people and then like put them into categories where you can say, maybe like we need to track these people because they are bad. But we've evolved quite a bit. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, no, great. Thank you.